<clears throat> so, Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for those that are here. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your word as we study each Wednesday night. And, Lord, thank you that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And, Lord, you promise that when we hide it in our hearts, Lord, we won't sin against you. And, Lord, thank you that you, as we look into your word, you reveal yourself to us in a wonderful way. And we bless you, Lord. We ask that, Lord, as we look this evening, that, Father, we'll learn wonderful things from your word. And we bless you. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to teach us tonight as you promised you would. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, book of Psalms. I don't know how much we'll write tonight, but we'll see, okay? <clears throat> now, this is interesting. The book of Psalms. The entire collection of Psalms is entitled, in the Hebrew, Praises, but it's actually entitled this, because later on the rabbis designated the book of prayer and praises. That means tefillah, tehillim which means praises and prayer, the book of praises and prayer. The Septuagint later on, you know, just named it Psalms, and it's actually uh, used that way because the Greek word just means Psalms, okay? And in Luke chapter 20, verse 42, and Acts chapter 1, verse 20, it's called that by the apostles and by Jesus himself. It calls it the book of Psalms. The Greek verb from which the, the noun Psalms comes from denotes a plucking or a twanging of strings, which means it's guitar players, okay? This means it gives us an understanding that these poems were meant to be set to music, and we're going to see that as we go along tonight. It's going to be actually, I think, kind of fun. Our English title is, it derives itself from the Greek term and its background meaning Psalms. Now, the Psalms made up the Israel's hymn book, which defined their worship of Jehovah. This was their worship book, the book of Psalms. And it defined their worship. And we're going to see some of the definitions of that and how they actually did some things as we dig into it tonight. Now, there's, there's various authors. There's no one author. That's why I didn't put it up here. They're, they're various. We have actually seven that we know of, and then there was others that we don't know who actually wrote them. Seventy-five psalms were written by David. Twelve psalms were written by Asaph, who was a musician. Ten psalms were written by the sons of Korah which many of them were musicians. Two psalms were written by Solomon. One psalm was written by Moses. One psalm was written by Haman, okay, or Heman. Haman most likely is how it was pronounced. One psalm was written by Ethan. And then 48 psalms were by Anonymous. We don't know who they wrote them. Some have been attributed to Ezra. That he probably wrote some of these. The date somewhere between 1410 to 450 B.C. There was a thousand years in between all these psalms. Isn't that interesting? Now, the background and the theme of it, and it's somewhere between 1410 to 400 B.C. Yeah, it's about a thousand years, about a millennium in between all these psalms, or, or during the writing of all these psalms when they collected them all. The collection, they, these, these collected psalms comprise the largest book in the Bible, the most frequently quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament. Psalms 117 is the uh, exact middle chapter of the Bible, which is really cool, all right? Psalm 119 is the largest chapter in the entire Bible, okay? Historically, the psalms range in time from the origin of life all the way to post-exilic uh, joys of the Jews who were liberated from Babylon, according to uh, John MacArthur. There are numerous types of psalms, but throughout the different genre, the main theme is worship of the Lord. That's the, the main theme of the whole book. The Lord God is worthy to be worshipped for who he is and for his faithfulness to his people. And that's the, the, the theme of the book of Psalms. Now there's some divisions. Am I going too fast? Okay, you guys can jump in. There's some divisions. The Psalms were collected over the years into books to be used in Israel's worship. Now, if you look like in the New American Standard, my Bible, it breaks them up into books. There's book one, which is Psalms 
1 verse, I mean, 1 all the way through Psalm 41, chapter 41. Book 2, Psalm 42 through 72. Book 3, Psalm 73 through 89. Book 4, Psalms uh, 90 through 106. And book 5, Psalms 107 through 150. The Psalms is divided into five sections, as we saw, each closing with a doxology or benediction. These divisions were probably introduced by the final editors to imitate the fivefold division of the Torah, which is the scriptures of the Hebrew. As for, we stated already, the Psalms were largely written for the purpose of Israel's worship in the temple. Some Psalms, like the Psalms of Ascent, which I'll tell you about in a minute, were collected and used while the people traveled to Jerusalem for the ritual of Passover, thus making their pilgrimage to Jerusalem a time of worship. Others were used in service of the temple itself. The types of psalms, as we study, we'll see Psalms 120 through 134 songs or psalms of ascent. When they would be going up to worship, they would sing these psalms. Psalms of praise, and there's too many to mention. Psalms of lament, psalms of wisdom, psalms of royalty. And I'm sure we could probably, you know, add different, uh, different types if you really want to look at it. Now, let me ask you a question. What's your favorite psalm? 143. Psalm 143? Read it, if you would. <laughs> psalm 143, read it, or read some of it. Why is that your favorite? I guess because, I mean, my favorite verses are 8, 9, and 10, which is, mm -hmm. let me hear your loving kindness in the morning, and teach me to walk in your will, and to seek the ways of my enemies, mm -hmm. and to do well. Uh, from how, from how little. <laughs> Why is it your favorite? I don't know, I just, I just fell in love with it. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Who's got another favorite? What's your favorite psalm? Lisa. 23. <laughs> psalm 23. That's everybody's favorite. Read it. Read it. Go ahead. Why is that your favorite? I learned it when I was six, and then the next Easter Sunday I was baptized. Nice. As, as a six-year-old. So it's been in my brain since then, and it's just something that I've always fallen back on because it's just comforting to know that he restores your soul. He's your shepherd. He's there constantly. Mm. But it's just always been in my mind. 
What's another favorite? My daddy was one of my ten greatest reading No, well, you haven't got time to read that one. <laughs> Psalm 1. Psalm 1? Why is that your favorite? Well, read it first. Why is that your favorite? So just um, when I was just trying to figure everything out in my early 20s, and uh, I was just hanging around with uh, a lot of people I shouldn't be around, <laughs> and uh, really I was just, I was actually at, at a monastery, and I started to meditate on my, the song starting there, on the simplest prayer. Excellent. Who else? Come on, Rich. You're smiling at me, so you got one. I know you got one. Okay, what's one that pops up? Who else? Okay, I only can share one. Anybody else? <laughs> I had a feeling somebody's going to ask. You know what? It's interesting. One of my favorites is Psalm 84 also. It's the first few verses. It says, How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts. 
My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. The bird also has found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, how blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you, Selah. Those are my favorite verses. And I'll tell you why. Because when I got saved, one of the things I used to love to do, and I, I would get out, get out of school in my senior year, and I would drive up to the church, and I would sit in a sanctuary just by myself. And I would pray, and I would take my guitar, and I would sit in there and sing. And um, before I even really understood what's going on here, and I used to love because I know the building isn't housed the presence of God, I do, but it was just something wonderful about it. And through the years, even to this day, I still love That's why when, I'll say, when we were repainting years ago, and we put the signs up, and they said, we're going to put auditorium, right? And I went, no. I said, we're going to put sanctuary, because to me, it's always been the sanctuary. It's where everybody gathers for one purpose. And then as I started studying this, and I realized what, you know, what the sons of Korah were writing, is that in the, in the tabernacle, the birds would literally get in to the tabernacle, and they would make nests in the tabernacle. And they felt, and now, now remember that, as it says, it's my, my soul longs and even yearn for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy in the living God. The bird also has found a house. And the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts. You know, the birds, the cre- Yeah, that's exactly what they're talking about. And you go, wow. It says, even your altars. My king and my God, how blessed are those who dwell in their house. They are ever praising you. And during that time, you know, when this is going on, most likely this is probably written during the time of David, where he instituted... 24 hours, seven day a week worship for over 33 years in Jerusalem. He had set it up. And a lot of the Psalms that he had written came out of that time where he set it up where they would sing night and day. And so anytime that you walked into the tabernacle, which he set up in Jerusalem, there was always worship going on. Always. You know, they had. You know, I heard, I heard a guy say one, one time, they, they had, you know, they had, uh, you know, a fresh set of pickers coming in every, you know, every 10 hours or 8 hours or whatever it was. And it was their job to worship the Lord and magnify the Lord 24 hours and 7 days a week. Yeah, that's where I have got it from. When, I remember when Mike Bickle got the, you know, the, the call to do that. When he felt the Lord telling him to do it, he announced it for the very first time in a meeting I was in up at Morningstar. And uh, he said, we're going tr- to do this. And it was incredible. You know, it's great. I've never been there, but I heard it's wonderful. You know. So that's always been my psalm. That's why. Because I've always loved the sanctuary in the church buildings. I always go to the sanctuaries when I go into a church I wanna, because I want to feel it. And I would sit. I've written many songs. I've written sermons. I've laid on the floor. I've cried. I prayed because the sanctuary was the place that I loved to go. Now I'm going to get all teary-eyed thinking about it. So stop. Okay, here we go. Let's do a quick survey of the Psalms. And then we're going to get into some technical stuff, like we just talked about, about King David. In the book of Psalms, Christ is is shown as king. And there's a bunch of Psalms, you know, 2, 18, 20, 21, 24, 47, 110, 132. Christ is shown as king. He's also shown as a suffering servant, Psalm 17, 22, 33, 40, 41, 69, 109. Christ is a perfect man in Psalm 8, Psalm 16, Psalm 40. Christ is the Son of God in in Psalm 19, Psalm 102, and Psalm 118. And then, you know, I won't go through all this, but you can read it. It's in the notes if you grab one. There's some up here. There's a, a chronological picture of the Messiah is portrayed in the Psalms. And what it would look like is this. I'll show you real quick. He will come in uh, the name of the Lord, Psalm 118, verse 26. He will come to do the will of God, Psalm 40, verses 7 through 8. The Lord will declare him to be his son, Psalm 2, verse 7. Oh, we'll read through him. 
he will have zeal for that Lord's house, and it will consume him, Psalm 69, 9. Remember, that was in the New Testament. He will uh, be needlessly hated, Psalm 35, verse 19. His friend will betray him, Psalm 41, verse 9. He will be falsely accused, Psalm 35, verse 11. He will be cruelly mocked, Psalm 22, verses 7 through 8. His hands and feet will be pierced, Psalm 22, verses 16. No, not one of his bones will be broken, Psalm 34, 20. People will gamble for his clothes, Psalm 22, verse 18. He will pray for his enemies, Psalm 109, verse 4. He will give, uh, be given vinegar to drink, Psalm 69, verse 21. He will be resurrected from the dead, Psalm 16, verse 10. He will ascend to the right hand of God, Psalm 68, verse 18. He will become a priest like Melchizedek, Psalm 110, verse 4. He will be the chief cornerstone, Psalm 118, verse 22. His throne will endure forever, Psalm 45, verse 6. His enemies will be subjected to him, Psalm 110, verse 1. And all things will be put under his feet, Psalm 8, verse 6. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. God's very precise. <laughs> Where, you know, what's Psalms place in the canon, in the, in the completed scriptures? Psalms was considered to be the songbook of the nation of Israel. Historically, we can learn about the Israelites' beliefs about God from these songs, which they sing about him. Theologically, we learn from the Psalms that God is worthy of praise, of worship and praise, and his faithfulness in all, for his faithfulness in all situations of life. And devotionally, we should respond to Psalms by trusting God in the hard times of our lives and worshiping him even in the midst of trials. Yeah. I got a quick question about all the chronological things. Okay. Yes, to both of them, because if you look at the Bereans, it said that they were studying to see if what Paul was saying was true. And they, the only scriptures that they had was, was the Torah, was the Old Testament. And so that's what they would look through to see what Paul was saying, because Paul became to understand when he, when he accepted Christ, and he could see, I'm sure, that Christ was all through the Old Testament. And thus he would preach from that, as you saw many times when he would preach. He would bring it up. And so the Bereans would look through it. So... To answer your question, yes, on both of those, from what I understand. You know, some, you know, know Christ and they see it, boom, it's there. Others are looking for, is, is Jesus really real? They can see it in there. In fact, it still goes on today. I've sat with a number of Jewish people over my life, my, my brother-in-law, you know, and sat with him and, and talked about the scriptures and pointed things out. And he would look and he'd go, you know, you're right about that. He hasn't accepted Christ yet, but he's seen it. He knows it. Then there's others who, when you know, you have Isaiah, what, 53, you have Psalm 118, and all these others are pointing to Christ. And many of the rabbis, if you read some of their writings, are denying that, and they're using it for other, you know, they're saying other things from it. Yeah, Psalm 22. There are places that it is talking about a specific person or a specific thing, but it, it's a prophetic word at the same time pointing towards Christ, even though there is a natural thing that's going on, but it's also pointing towards. <clears throat> that can be confusing. That's where the rabbis many times will get, you know, will say, no, it's not talking about that. It's not talking about the Messiah. If it's about the Messiah, it'll say it's about the Messiah. No, not necessarily. You know, the things... What Deuteronomy twenty nine twenty nine, things revealed to man are ours forever, but the things that God doesn't reveal, they belong to Him. Yeah. So, and some of that is by revelation. Okay, is that good? Everybody, all right? Okay. Let's look at a couple of things in Psalms. 
As we study Psalms, we find many, if not all, you know, if not all the expressions of praise and worship seen in the Christian church today. Here's a list. It's not exhaustive, but this is from Psalms. We sing to him, Psalm 149, verse 1. Let's look at some of these. Okay, let's look at it. Psalm, turn to Psalm 149. There's another one up here if somebody needs one. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. And it's praise in the congregation of the godly ones. So we see there's singing and there's many more. This is just, you know, again, just one, one or two verses for each thing. Singing new songs, uh, Psalm 144, verse 9, tells us to sing new songs. What do you think a new song is? Okay. I'm asking something because it's, one, it's a very uh, controversial, you know, hmm? Singing in tongues, that's one people think is singing, is singing a new song, is singing in tongues. Whatever, come to your heart and mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What else? Mm -hmm. It was funny, I, I, I was doing a, um, a worship part of a worship seminar in Texas uh, for like three days and I was doing a, uh, one of the things on you know guitar leading guitar leading with guitar and worship and and um, one of these young I'll say the way I said it back then one of these young cats you know wrote, he was going okay so what do you do man I mean what do you do you call what do you call a new song you know unto the Lord how do you do a new song unto the Lord I said you write anything new lately? He goes, well, yeah. I said, okay, you got a new song. And he goes, no, that's not what I'm looking at. That's not what I, what I mean. You know, you know, that new song, that, you know, that spirit-led song. I said, what makes that the only new song? And he goes, well, you know what? I said, every song was new one time, wasn't it? And he goes, yeah, I guess so. I, I said, I'm not being sarcastic. I said, we got to understand. This is a broad thing here. He goes, I said, what does new song mean in the scripture? He goes, I don't know. And I remember I got it written right here because <laughs> I looked it up a long time ago. This word new song is the word chadash. And chadash means this. It means new, renewed, or fresh. That's all it means. And we can put all kinds of things to it, which doesn't mean they're wrong, like singing in tongues, singing a new song. I, I believe that's a new song. Absolutely. I believe, you know, introducing a new song to the church is a new song. You know, I believe when you write a song, it's a new song. I believe you can stand there with your guitar and play a couple of chords and sing whatever the Lord placed in your heart on time. That's a new song, too. So it can mean a wide range of things is what I guess I'm saying. But it is an act of worship in every, any way that is, is, is expressed. In that. Everybody cool? You change the words to nothing else on it. We did that. Yeah, me too did it in church one time and people were standing up on the seats like they were in a concert like this because we took cocaine and changed the words to it <laughs> huh <laughs> what's the first words of cocaine anybody remember if you want to get down get down on the ground just pray dun, 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 dun. <laughs> If you got bad news, you want to kick those blues, just pray. It's all right, it's all right, it's all right to pray. Na, 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 na. That's what we did. <laughs> I loved it. We did it one time, and it's never been debuted again, <laughs> ever again. But it was fun. I'm sorry I just corrupted you all by telling you that. <laughs> okay, here's another. <laughs> You'll never forget it, you know, now when you ever hear that song out somewhere. Okay, speaking about God. Now, here's, here's something. we got to understand something. That speaking about God, just like we're talking about, hey, God did this in my life, it is an act of praise and worship. Nowadays, you know, which is it's wonderful. I love the new worship movement. I was part of it. It was great. It was wonderful. But we've gotten where we've taken worship and we sucked it into this little thing where it's got to be musical. It's got to be, 
you know, with instruments, it's got to be this. It doesn't. Just talking about God to one another is an act of worship. Look at it real quick. Look at Psalm 145. Look at 145. Look at verse 6. Men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts, and I will tell of your greatness. Now stop right there. Isn't that great? Men will speak of your awesome acts, and I'll tell of your greatness. It's an act of worship. We don't do that much anymore. Playing musical instruments, Psalm 150, verses 3 through 5, and Psalm 149, 3, and Psalm 144, 9, and there's many other places where it talks about playing instruments to the Lord. So that's an act of worship. Shouting joyfully to him, praising God loudly for his triumphs. You don't see that in church all. Because we're afraid, because when we come in here, we think we have to be quiet. And we don't. There's times that we need to shout. Do we manufacture it? No. But should we do it? Yeah. Yeah. Lifting our hands. An outward expression of our hearts, showing dependency, gratitude, and or surrender. Lifting our hands in worship. I remember as a Baptist, that was so hard for me to do because we didn't do it much. But I remember I would go, and I was, I was like the closet Baptocostal. When I would go sing at the coffee houses, I would lift my hands and have a great time. But in church, if no one was doing it, I would, and sometimes I'd sit on them because I'd want to lift my hands. But then it's, it, it, it was hard sometimes because it wasn't accepted. But we're supposed to do it. Please. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you were standing doing this? And of course, we're, you know, we're doing our thing. <laughs> <laughs> we're the only ones doing our thing. And the guy goes, it is okay if y'all clap your hands and go, move about a little. Because <laughs> me, I said, do what that lady's doing. <laughs> for you. Good for you. See, I can say these things because I was born and bred a Southern Baptist, and I believe I still am in heart at times. But, you know, the, you know, the Baptist dancing is this. That's it. You know, on Sunday morning, yeah, Baptist dancing. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Uh, yeah, at times they didn't, especially when they're preaching. So another one, bow lo bowing low with our faces to the ground is an act of worship, demonstrates reverence and respect. It's in Psalm. Psalms 95, verse 6 and 7. And there's other places in there too. Kneeling is an act of worship. Humility, meekness, submission. Standing in his presence. Acknowledgement of reverence and service to, the, to royalty. See, I, I, that's one thing. I remember I said this one night. I, I miss that. Because I remember in one Baptist church that I was part of, when the pastor would stand up and he would say, this is my text this morning. Let's all stand as we read the word of God. I loved that. Because it was a respect and standing before the Lord. And he looked, as we saw in, um, in Nehemiah, and in Ezra, where they would come and they would stand before the Lord for hours all day and hear the word of God. Man, we don't, we don't have that kind of you know, desire anymore. Man, we ought to bring it back. Okay, so standing in his presence, clapping our hands. It's a release of joy, of thanks, also a powerful tool against the, the enemy's strongholds, many times combined with shouting and praise and singing. In fact, it's, uh, where is that scripture? It says to the sound of uh, harps and tambourines that the, that the Lord will lay stripes on the back of the enemy. Do you know, I know I've told you this, but some of you probably weren't here a number of years ago when I said this. This, we take it as like an applause, right? And it can be. And it's over the years it's evolved to that. 
But do you know in a Hebrew battle strategy was that they would stand on the hill before their enemy and they would just start doing this and they would clap and they would shout as they were clapping and it would strike fear into the hearts of their enemy and then they would run down the hill and go kill them all. <laughs> it was an act of war because this meant we're mocking you because you're dead today. And we forget that, that when we stand and, 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 and we are clapping and we are praising the Lord, we're telling at the same time, if, you know, from our hearts, hopefully, the enemy, there's nothing you're going to do. This is a sound of mockery to the enemy and a sound of praise to God. There you go. All you people, right? There you go. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, and then here's another one that Keith reminded me of when he said in the monastery, meditating. Meditating upon the word of God, Psalm 77, verse 12, pondering the attributes of God in our hearts, meditating. Being quiet before the Lord, taking his, his word and thinking about it, thinking about him. We should do that because it says we're even supposed to do that on our beds at night as we're going to sleep. Meditate on the Lord, think about him. And then the last one, Dancing. Now, I haven't gone that far yet in my worship. Celebrates God's victory and is a full expression of joy and rejoicing. Also expresses intimacy with the Lord. I, I'm thankful that the Lord let me make the music that he danced to and not dance. <laughs> because I'm not a dancer. Okay, so musical terms. We good on that? <laughs> Every time I said something like that, God's done something, you know. <laughs> You'll know God showed up if that happens. <laughs> you know, yeah, Chuck Berry across the... No, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, here we go, some musical terms. Let's look at some things here, okay? Gonna, let me ask you a question. Does anybody, has the Lord ever, now you put this in my head, has the Lord ever got you to do something that you weren't comfortable doing? Anybody want to share anything? Like in worship, specifically in worship. I told you one about lifting hands. Okay. You might have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's funny. We'll do all kinds of things in concerts and, and stuff like that and sporting events, but when we come to church, we get like all, you know, stuffy, you know, inhibited. Yeah, that's a nicer way of saying it, stuffy. Remember one time it was a worship. I was with a, two other worship leaders leading worship at a, a conference for. Um, it was um, about Israel and about praying 
that they would accept the Messiah. It was, you know, a lot of, uh, like, Jews for Jesus and many other uh, Messianic ministries were there. And um, this was... This was during the time of the renewal, you know, especially in the vineyard. This wasn't a vineyard event, but there was a number of vineyard people there, and the, and the renewal had really hit down in South Florida where I was. And, um, but it was one of those things where you don't, you know, you love it, you can watch it, it's great, but don't let that happen to me type of feeling, you know. I mean, there were people going, oh, during the worship, you know, like, with their, like wings out, you know. And stuff like that. And I was going, oh, you know, it's great. Great, cool. Yeah, go. God bless you. Don't do that to me, man. You know, and I'm leading worship. And I was, I forgot what song. It was some Dom Potter song. And I was leading it. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, I felt my body going, you know, it was starting to shake. But it was not, not the, you know, like I was cold or something. I, was, I couldn't stop it. And then it would stop, you know. And the piano player, you know, uh, Clarence, Claren was over there, and he could see me because he was like had the piano sideways. I was like right here, on a like a riser with my guitar stuff, and then the other guy who's a bass player, who's a worship leader, Steve Cruz, was over here, and we had the rest of the band. But the three of us were kind of tag teaming, and Claren, you know, we're playing. Oh, it was, it was come, come, come. I was leading the song. It was a real like you know calling forth the north, the south, the east, the west type of thing, and you know, calling people into salvation, and I was leading, it was a real driving, and I start going, and I look up, and my eyes caught Clarence's eyes, he went, oh, and I'm going, and I couldn't stop, and I'm shaking, I'm going, no, this, God, this isn't you, this isn't me, I mean, I, I come, come, and I started where it would, it would bang on my guitar, my guitar was banging against me like this, you could hear it, and the leader of the, of the conference is down there. He's going, what's going on? And Clarence, Clarence, he's going, this is cool. Go for it. Let it happen. I'm going, shut up. <laughs> yeah. And, it, and pretty soon it got so bad where he had to take the song over. And my buddy Steve is standing next to him going, <laughs> <laughs> laughing like this maniacal laugh. You know, so I'm, and, and I finally, they ended the song, and I was just sitting there going, <laughs> and, and I'm going, oh, God, God, what are you doing? This can't be, what are you, this doesn't make sense. You ever said that? So I finally, I start, I'm going like this, going, walking off the platform, and I get down in my chair, and so Denise is looking at me going, what's happening to you? I said, I don't know, I can't stop. And she go, okay, Lord, if this, you know, just calming down, and she put her hand on me, calming down. And I started going, ah, yeah. but the two ladies were intercessors in back of me, and they'd lean over and put their hand on me and start praying, and I would start shaking again. And then Denise would go, stop, and she would calm me down. It was, it was like schizophrenic, you know, spirit-filled stuff. <laughs> and, it kept, and I shook, and we had a waterbed, too. So I shook all night. Denise had to go sleep in another room, you know, in our house, because I couldn't stop shaking. And I would shake while I was sleeping. Do I know what God did? I have no idea. But do I know it was him? Yeah. I've never had that happen since, thank God. Yeah. Because I knew in, in my heart that it was him. There was no, yeah, there was an assurance that it was him. Yes. Absolutely. But it would, and plus I was fighting it too because I didn't, I didn't want it. I didn't want him to do it. But I think he said, no, you need to experience this. Because I've seen people do it. You know, I prayed for people and they would start doing it and shaking or they fall over and shake or they, you know. Hmm? Benefit me? That's what I said. I don't know. But it made me know that there's things like that that happen. Yeah. That's about all I can say. Was it an act of worship? I'll take it that way because my heart was worshiping. You know? So I don't know why I'd share that with you. Maybe just throw it out there that someone ha something happens like that. Somebody does that. Don't be afraid of it. Yeah. Because God's up to something. Okay, let's look at some, some words. Okay, turn to Psalm 22. Yeah, well, the Quakers used to do that, yeah. That's what they would do. They would quake. 
And there were people here when I came here that would do it, like they would pray for somebody and their hand would shake. Yeah. Where do you think holy rollers came from? People get hit with the laughter and joy of the Lord, and they would roll down the aisle of the church. They were called holy rollers. That's where that came from. You know, um, uh, slain in the spirit, you know where that came from? But you know why? Because they looked like they were dead. Mm -hmm. You know what barking up the wrong tree is? Where it came from? We always think it has to do with, with, um, with coon dogs looking for you know, a raccoon up in the wrong tree. It actually came from the Cane Ridge Revivals. Because what would happen in the Cane Ridge Revival is that people would start going, ha! Ha! when the Holy Spirit would hit them. And they would lose control. And they would take them and they would t tie them to a tree during the revival because they would fall over and they would be, and they wanted, they take them outside and they tie them to a tree. And they would be on the tree and they go, ha, 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 and they called it barking up the wrong tree. I don't know. I'm just telling you things I've read over the years. See, we don't realize that a lot of what happened in the renewal had already happened in many other revivals before. You know, and especially the Cane Ridge Revival in the Kentucky area and all that, you know, that area up there, because all kinds of things. They used to have wagons. Why am I telling you this? I don't know. <laughs> because I'm praying that some of this stuff happens here eventually. You know, they would have wagons and they would go because as people would get near to where they were, the revival was going on, they would be walking along and they would just fall out under the power of God and they would be just people strewn on the road to get to the place. Within a certain radius, they would just start falling out in the Lord. And so what they would do, they would take a wagon and these guys would pick them up and throw them up on the wagon like, like dead people. And they would take them to the, you know, to the uh, revival, and then they would just lay them all out, you know, all over the, all, all over the area out the, until they woke up. And sometimes they would lay there for days out under the power of God, and they would get up, God had changed them, they got saved, and they'd live a whole different life. There would be barking, that, ah! there would be shouting, there would be shaking, they would fall out, there was tongues, there was all kinds of manifestations. That's why people get so uptight over things that happen, but when the pre it's like this. When the presence of God, a holy God, invades a human body, how is that going to ma be manifested? How is the body going to react? We think it's just, we, you know, we bow and we do this. It's not always that. Sometimes it is. You know, sometimes it's not. I didn't want to get slain in the spirit. I told God not to do it, and he did it. You know, he did by a guy I didn't really like a whole lot, Benny Hinn. You know, but I hit the ground, and I couldn't stop it. And there were several times in my life that that's happened where I couldn't stop it. And God did something in me during those times. Don't always know exactly what it was, but I got up, and I knew that something had changed. All acts of worship. Hmm? God what? God of order? Mm -hmm. What's in the new order, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit there in the new order? I, like I said, you know, the, I guess the best way, and all my trying to figure it out, talking to people, reading books on it, you know, reading, you know, Finney and all these different, you know, preachers that have seen stuff like that, that didn't like it, and then eventually came around to understanding it, that, you know, there's been all kinds of ways to try to explain it, but none of them have really set good with me. The only thing that, at least in my heart, is like I said, how would a human body react to the absolute power of God? What happened to John in the book of Revelation when the angels came? He said he fell down like a dead man before him. We in our, 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 our uh, how would you say, uh, modern mind would think he just was just laid down but he wasn't like out cold he just was laying down because of an honor like a royalty it's not what it's talking about it said he collapsed like a dead man he was out how do you think he got the vision you know we think he was just sitting there all of a sudden it just went zoo and it might have 
because I think it was a series of different things that, you know, visions that he had. But this, it says he fell down like a dead man. How do you explain that? I don't know. Hmm? As far as we know, but we don't know. It, it, yeah, it's not recorded. We don't know. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. What happened in, when they dedicated the temple? All the priests and everybody got laid out. And they said they couldn't perform their duties <laughs> because of the presence of God. Yeah. And do some people fake it? Yes. Do they believe in faking it till you make it? I've heard that, yes. But, I, you know, okay. I told you about that friend of mine that this preacher tried to push him down, and he was a biker. This guy's a biker, a real biker, not these wannabes. He's a, he's a, he's a one percenter. And he was standing there, and the preacher came up to him, you know, was going, walking along, and people were just falling. And Chuck's standing there like this, and the preacher comes up and goes, you know, in the name of Jesus. And he pushed him like this, and Chuck goes, don't do that. And he goes, no, in the name of Jesus. And Chuck pushed him back. <laughs> right there in the revival, pushed him back. The guy almost fell. And he went, he, and he went to the next guy. Because he goes, I'm not going to fake it. But then I saw Chuck get laid out by God like you wouldn't believe. Just boom. You know? It's scary. It's scary. It's, it's because we're so used to being in control. And we think if we don't have control, you know, we could get deceived. Well, to a point, you can. But I don't think it's in a place where the people are seeking the same God that you're seeking. It was like when I got tongue. Yeah, exactly. And we can miss some things that God may want to do. Because I'm a guy that doesn't, you know, don't bring any surprises on me. I don't like to be scared. I don't like to be surprised. You know, I never was that way. You know, you know don't come up and scare me or <laughs> from behind because I turn around and pop you. Okay? But it's just the way, my makeup. But when God started doing things like this to me. I'm, I'm longing for him again. It's been a time where there been, hasn't been that kind of stuff, but I'm longing for it again. I want to see a holy, just incredible thing, a move of God. And when those moves of God happen, there's people weeping, there's people falling over, there's people getting, you know, in the back trying to come up to get saved and they'll fall out under the presence of God. Nobody prayed for them. They didn't say the sinner's prayer or any of that stuff. When they get up, they had had an encounter with God. They're saved, sanctified, homogenized, holified, and all that other kind of stuff. You know, I want to see it. I want to see, I want to see, you know, I call it stacking the bodies just all across the front, you know. As people just falling in the presence of God, crying, shaking, you know, shouting. Anybody ever been in a meeting like that? Mm -hmm. They're great, aren't they? Now, you can't, you know, after a while, it's like, okay, calm it down a little bit, Lord, you know. But, yeah, they're, they're great. You ever tell you what happened to me? Why am I telling you? You want to hear these things? I'll stop. <laughs> yeah, I went to the Brownsville Revival. And I think I've told you guys, some of you guys have heard this. And, uh, and this is like the second time I ever got laid out in the spirit, okay? And I was with that guy, Claren. <laughs> this is before I started the shaking thing. And Claren would, and I went up there together. And Claren was a, he's, a, he's a, a very gentle musician. And that makes me very uncomfortable, okay? Because he would walk over to me and go, I'm going to do it to Walker, but he knows I don't mean this. He'd go, he goes, I just love you. And he would grab my head like this and go, I just love you so much. <laughs> I'm going to knock you to ground in love in a minute, okay? Now, just don't do that to me. I don't mind a good man hug and stuff. But, you know, just, oh, you're so precious, you know. <laughs> but he's a one, wonderful, wonderful man. And so we went to, together. And we, uh, we waited like about eight hours, I think, to get in. Because he wanted to get there, and he wanted to get in, like, in the front. So we stood out there in this Florida panhandle sun. So we get in. We got about four or five rows from the front. And I got, I'm an I'm a end row guy, okay? Don't put me in the middle. Put me on the end. And so I'm sitting there, Clarence next to me, and then a bunch of other people. So it was great. You know, Lindo Cooley was leading worship. It was great. And we were worshiping like crazy. And, you know, what's his, I forgot the 
preacher's guy's name, you know, got up there and he preached, did a great, great sermon, very, very incredible. Then they had a ministry time. And so they, when they had a ministry time, people just flocking up to the front. So Clarence goes, you want to go up front? I went, no, we're only five rows from the front. He said, we'll stay here. And so they ministering and about an hour into it, it was like a, we we're three hours into the service already, hour into it. You know, one of the pastors comes walking, but he's just walking, he's just hitting people like this. And they're just, he, it's like he's parting the Red Sea. People are just falling out. And so he comes up, and I don't like where Walker is, and he's touching people, and he looks over at me, and he goes, boom, like this. And, I, and lights went out. I mean, they literally did. I was out cold in the spirit. I didn't know that I had, was standing on this here, and when he touched me, I shot up into the air and landed with my head in Clarence's lap. If I would have known, I would have gotten up, okay? And so I don't know. I, he said I was out for like about 30 minutes. I was out cold. You know, the, and the Lord, I know the Lord did something in my heart. I know he did. But when I came to, I'm looking up, and Claren is rubbing my head like this. And he looks at me and goes, was it good? And I went, God, and I jumped up. And I'm looking at and he goes, what did God do? I said, I don't know. Don't talk to me right now. God, what happened? And, and so the lady in back goes, you sailed about four feet in the air. <laughs> what does that mean? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But I know it was God. How? Because it's in here. You know, it, has that happened again? No. Maybe it's just for the benefit of calming people down. <laughs> I don't know. But it happens because God does things like that. Now let's go back. Let's get into the stuff here because we only got a few more minutes. Okay, Psalm 22. Look at the top of Psalm 22 in your Bible. You know, I don't know what, what, what version you may have, but in the top of the scripture there, it said, it'll say something like, for the choir director upon Ajeleth Hashashar, a Psalm of David. Does this, some of yours have that? Okay, now, that phrase, when you look it up, it means it's the name of a song, the hind of the morning, or it can be translated, the strength at daybreak. And it's possibly a psalm or song that David had written that he said, I want these words put to that music. Is all it is. So we can see things like that, that, is, that, that there's songs and something, you know, that it possibly could have been a, a popular song of the time. And he said, I want these words put to that song. Like we change the words to cocaine, okay? But I don't think it's that. It means the hind of the morning, Okay, or the strength at daybreak. And it was most likely a song that David had written. And he said, put these words to that tune. Now, if you look at Psalm 46, look at Psalm 46. Look at the top of it again. It says, for the choir director. What does that tell you right there? Okay, it's a song. Okay, the sons of Korah. It says, a psalm of the sons of Korah set to Alamoth, a song. Now, let me show you. This is really interesting. This Alamoth means it's for treble or soprano singers. Uh, you know, most likely from what we understand from understanding a little bit about Hebrew worship, it was a choir of singing maidens. The three sailors of Psalm 46 were set so that the musicians would back off and let the maidens come forth or as we, you would somebody let them take off vocally. And, oh, yeah. Oh, yes. See? That's what I said. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the sons of Korah. Actually, they're the writers of it, okay? okay? A psalm of the sons of Korah. They wrote this. They wrote this psalm. And they said they wanted sung by soprano or treble type voices, tenors and, and sopranos. But most likely it was sopranos. And 1 Chronicles 15, 19 talks about a very similar thing. So look at Psalm 57. It says, for the choir director, set to what? Altasheth, a mictum of David when he fled from Saul to the cave. Now, look at what it says. This is cool. 
the Altesheth means thou do, thou do not destroy. Possibly a popular song of the day, Psalm 57, Psalm 58, Psalm 59, Psalm 75, I'll talk about this. This is the tune they want it set to. Mm -hmm. See, we, you know, nowadays we've got to write the same tune for everything. I mean, not the same tune, not the same tune for everything. It's a different tune for everything. But see, they would easily take, let's change the words to this. Let's put the same tune to these words. I look at Psalm, let's, let's go to 81. We'll just keep going forward. Go to Psalm 81. It says, For the choir director on the Giddeth, a Psalm of Asaph. Now, if I'm correct, it's been a while since I, you know, I didn't write it down. But Asaph was, from what I understand, I think he was a drummer. He was a percussionist in the temple. And he was in charge of all those that played that type of instruments, played the drums. He was a drummer. Okay? So the Giddeth is a wine, it, it means wine press or an eight string harp. Now, that's interesting because he's a drummer, but he says, put it on a harp. Seven notes. You know, on the, on the actual getteth, okay? Eighth means it starts a new beginning, so there was an eight-string harp. The uh, treading of the wine or the act. Here they would dance and call out to each other, you know, different things about the goodness of the Lord. You know, and Gethsemane means the same thing. But the getteth, it means a wine press, but it was also the name of an instrument. And they would dance to this. This was a dance. You ever, you ever I'm not going to do it. I know. Okay, I can keep a beat, but they would dance. And if you've ever been to a Jewish type of setting, like a bar mitzvah or a messianic setting, man, those guys, the men get out there and they do that, you know, thing, okay? If I, yeah, if I were a rich man, doobie doobie. Oh, now you put that song in my head, okay? But they would dance. But this was dancing to like a wine press, like you, you know, pressing things down, stomping on it. So imagine that. If the drummer wrote a song that he wanted to play it on hearts, what would he also have? He'd have a good beat to it. It would be a boom, boom, boom. But we've got to understand something. There was always a reason for these things. There was always a reason for that. Now think about that real quick. Think about a bunch of people standing there, pounding their feet like a wine press, and singing this to these words, sing for joy to the God of our strength. You see, the, you see how it would apply? Shout joyfully to the God of Jacob. Raise a, a song. Strike the timbrel, the sweet-sounding lyre with the harp. Blow the trumpet at the, new, uh, at the new moon, at the full moon, on our feast day. For it is a, a statute of Israel, our, an ordinance of the God of Jacob. He established it for a testimony to Joseph. When he went throughout the land of Egypt, I heard a language that I did not know. I relieved, uh, relieved his shoulder of the burden. His hands were freed from the basket. I mean, this is a, a, a powerful. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have it. You'd be surprised. This is a lot of... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. more, more messianic than they do in the, in the, in the, uh, the, the uh, orthodox or anything like that. But they do, you know, they do have some like that. But the messianic, oh, man, they tear this stuff up. Yeah, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's pretty wild. <laughs> Do you see the, the, the worship is, is, is not that different if you really think about it. Do we have pounding drums? Do we, yeah. Do we have driving beats? It's very scriptural to do this. Let's go on. Higion. Look at Psalm, uh, let's go to Psalm 93. Psalm 93, look at verse 3. I'll probably put the wrong one there. 
Yeah, you know, it's a bit different. Let me go. Let's look at Psalm 9, 16. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Let me look. Yeah. Look at Psalm 9, verse 16. says, the Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. It would be better to read the whole thing, but we don't have time tonight. In the work of his own hands, the wicked is snared. And it says right next to it, Higion, Selah. Okay, now look, let's look at what Higion means. It means a murmuring sound, a solemn sound, to speak to oneself as to meditate, a resounding sound, ref, uh, to reflect, to prophesy the word of God to yourself. It refers to thoughts of musing, internal thoughts. It means getting all emo, okay? Or possibly mockery or whispering external. A person's against someone, which is Lamentations chapter 3, verse 62. You know, um, you ever hear a, a remember when we, uh, what was her name? Asha. She would play her cello, and she would hit those real deep tones, and it would go, Rah. that's what this is. It means a deep tone that would be produced by the instruments, you know, which would call him to like a deep, you know, uh, uh, inner thinking, to think on something really hard. And so the worship would lead to that. And then the Selah would be the instruments taking that, which you'll see in a minute if we have time. It would take the instruments and they would interpret that, that feeling with the instruments without any voices. And there would be a time of reflection, a time, and it was many times it was used for the prophetic to come forth in Israel, for the priest or somebody to prophesy the word of the Lord over the people. Does that make sense? Is this beneficial? You want to keep going? Okay. Let's go to Psalm 56. Look what it says on there. For the choir director, according to Jonoth, or Jonoth, Jonath Elam, Rehokan, a victim of David, when the Philistines seized him in Goth. Now this is when it was written about. Now look what it says. Jonath Elam Rehokan. It means silent dove among those far away. It is a tune to which the psalm is set. Possibly another top 40 of the day. Okay, it was the tune. And so David said it to it. Now, let's, let's just move kind of quick. Go to the next one. Go to Psalm 88. And I'm hoping when you look at these things, you see, I, years ago I wrote these in, 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 my, in my Bible as I studied it. So that when I would see these things, I know what they were meaning. Psalm 88, a song, a psalm of the sons of Korah for the choir director, according to Mahalath Le, uh, Leonoth. A maskil of ha of Heman or Haman, the Ezraite. Mahalath means a mournful strain. It means a word. The word means sickness. Okay, which means to bow down, to be oppressed. So it was a very mournful, sad song that it was set to. And if you think about that, when you read it, it says, "O Lord, the God of my salvation, I have cried out day by day and in the night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry." It makes sense now, doesn't it? A very mournful, deep, depressing type of sound or music. A mictum is a poem of engraving on the heart and an attempt to record memorable thoughts, to impart wisdom. It means a commemoration. So evidently, the sons of Korah, as they wrote this, there was a reason behind this. There was something that was driving them, and they recorded it. That's why they call it a mictum. Oh, a mascal, excuse me. I'm sorry, mascal, I, I skipped down one. It means a song of instruction, reflective, didactic, a teaching song. A teaching song. The mictum is right after that. Psalm 16, 57, 58, 59, 60. It means a, point of, a poem of engraving. It means you want it, the song was designed to make it stick in them forever and ever. You ever hear a song that was from a time period in your life that when you hear that song, that all those memories come flashing back, hopefully good, but it's stuck in you, right? 
And it, all that tune, it just takes that tune to bring back whatever was going on in that time. That's exactly what this is talking about. Muth Laban in Psalm 9. If you want to look at it, I can read it later on. It means to, you know, to die for the sun, possibly a popular song at the time, but it also means it's for soprano voices also. A Niganoth. <laughs> Don't name your dog Niganoth. It means for stringed instruments. It's plural of Niganoth, Noah, more than uh, one harp. Psalm 54, 55, 61. But it's interesting because it also, it, it means a taunting song. It's used of taunting, a, a taunting song in some context, a song of mocking, of ridicule. So the Niganoth is. Nehiloth, or in Psalm 5, means for wind instruments. It means a perforated, it means perforated instruments. Winds, you know, uh, whatever they had back then, I don't know. Now real quick, sailors. I'm trying to move through this. We only got about five minutes. But I wanted to hit Selah. You can read the rest of them. Selahs are something that fascinates me. And there's no way I put the whole teaching in here. Just a, a real brief thing. It means a suspension of music or a pause. A suspension is for example of a dissonance or various notes. Um, where's my guitar? Hmm? Yeah. Can, uh, Walker, will you do me a favor, buddy? Will you go get my acoustic guitar back there for me real quick? It's in the back room. Yeah, back there where the guitars and amps are and stuff. It should be, I can think on the first couch there, it's a, or the second one, it's a, my acoustic guitar. It's a big case. It means the suspension, repetition, end of stanza, playing with full power, bending the body of the tone, short recurring symphony. Sailors are musical pictures. It can be any of those things. Musical pictures of what the song is saying to move the people toward the heart of God. Sometimes it's a suspension to hold the people at a place, then bring release. The sailor could paint a picture in a sound like uh, today's turnaround or a lead break. You know, a lot of times you may think, I don't think any of us do, but in some churches when the guitar player or the piano player takes a break and starts playing a lead, we think it's just, what is that? Oh, well, you're just letting him kind of do something to kind of fill her. It's not what it's for. Let me show you something real quick if I can. He knew which one it was. <laughs> it is a stringed instrument. Stringed. Yes. It's one of them. Exactly. In a song, you would sing something like, like, uh, yeah. Let's see. Uh, I surrender all. I surrender all. Right? All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. You ever hear him do something like this? What is that? Suspension, release. Dissonance, release. But you know in Israel, and I don't remember where I read this, but it was a guy that did a study on it. There, they can go back in some of the historical documents and they can find where God, where the, where the, the priest would hold the cord like And they would hold it for hours. And during that time, the other instruments would play over it to give the point where the people would meditate and think about what was just read to them by, by, the, by the priest, what God was saying. And also it was a point for the prophets or the priests that were prophetic to speak the word of God over people. And they would just hold it. Because why? There's a tension in that. And it makes you kind of go, you're going, come on, where are we going with this? And that's the whole point of it. God wanted the people to go, what are you going to say? What's happening? It's like something hasn't happened yet. You know, and they would read, you know, and the Lord says this. Da, 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 da. 
and it's over. See the point of it? That's one of the things that sailors would do. That's what it were for. It was to create that moment of attention in the middle of the song, in the middle of the song being sung, for God to do something. And then they would release it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, let's do it, let's do it this way. Um, you know, we have a soft song. Just hold it. It's all in the way you play it. You know, that moment where you just think about what you just sang. Then you go back to it. And you can sing over it all you want. Lord is good. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. And just take a moment, just think. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. It means all those things. So there's a reason that the writers, David and, and the sons of Korah and Asaph, all put these sailors in because why? There was a moment of reflection, whether it be the instruments interpreting what was going on because they would do that. If it was a, if it was a time of battle, the drums would interpret what was going on when they would worship all the night before they would go into battle, and the drums would interpret it. That was called a death nail sailor. And a death nail sailor, they would sit there and the drummers would play this war beat all night long to taunt the enemy, but also to tell Israel, this is what our God is going to do. And they would prophesy over that. And it was, it was an intimidation factor to the people that they were getting ready to conquer, the enemies of God, as they would think. It's pretty cool. So anyways, I wish we could. I got a whole study on sailors that I did. And it's an incredible, fascinating thing. So I'm hoping that as you look at the Psalms and as we think about worship even here at, at uh, NBC, that we can understand that there's a, a type of worship that we haven't even touched yet. And I'm praying that we do sometime. And in those moments where you hear, uh, you know, Daniel bust into a lead or me bust into a lead, more Daniel than me at times, or the drummer, I'm praying that Ronnie one Sunday just kind of takes off. Da, da, da. Jackie did that a couple of times. And we just turned her loose for a moment and let her just praise the Lord with the drums. Then we all just embrace it and don't feel uncomfortable. Because these are things that God is starting to bring about. And when we, we start responding to them, we're going to see different levels of worship start happening. Oh, yeah. That's why we call her Smacky Jackie, because she smacked them drums. Okay? Yeah. It's a whole different style than what Ronnie, Ronnie's got. But Ronnie's a great drummer. He's a great drummer. Okay, that's our word of prayer. This is the last one, remember, till September. So I hate this. I never thought I ever liked saying this. I don't. Don't show up next Wednesday. Okay? Or unless you want to go to the youth meeting. So <laughs> it's up to you. All right? Lord, thank you for tonight. And I pray that, Father, it was beneficial to our hearts. Lord, may we understand that you are a God of order but you are a God that can shake things up too and pull us out of any complacency. And Father, we know that you will never do anything that will be against your very nature or your word. So teach us. And we say, come Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.